This is the OTB Television Network, a service of Capital District Off-Track Betting. Turning for home, it's Landalusi taking the lead, drawing out by a length and a half of Barzalis, second by a length of Princess Larula, third on the outside, then Carambola, and bold outline into the stretch. It's Landalusi in front, drawing out by eight lengths. Barzell is second by a neck. Princess Larula third on the outside and bold outline on the rail. Landa Lucy just galloping by 12 lengths. Landa Lucy all by herself. Bold outline on the inside. Landa Lucy is the winner by 15 lengths. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Down the Stretch. I'm Mark Asano. On this morning's first official show of winter, we will welcome in a trio of special guests. Hall of Famer Gary Stevens will join us in about 10 minutes. From New York, Linda Rice, who uh, has a big weekend in front of her, will join us uh, toward the bottom of the hour. And in just a moment, Mr. Mike Dianzaris of Embrace the Race will also join us. We will look back at, I guess unofficially, Jerry Hollendorfer Day at Hollywood Park. And speaking of Hollywood, you just saw Landa Lucy win the 1982 Lassie. We've got three more historic Hollywood Park stakes races for you going to the internal break. So all of that and much, much more if you stay with us for this, our December 21st edition of the program, which is being sponsored by Embrace the Race the apparel for the horse racing lifestyle. Again, good morning. Welcome officially to winter on a very, very mild Saturday morning. If the rest of the winter were like it is this morning, I wouldn't complain so much. You're going to have to put up me uh, with me this morning, a little head cold, so let's hope the voice holds out. Our first guest this morning has been a very, very busy man during this uh, holiday season as the founder and president of our sponsor, and this is the final show of their sponsorship for 2013. We welcome from their headquarters and their store in Saratoga Springs, the founder and president of Embrace the Race, Mr. Mike Dianzaris. Mike, good morning. Good morning, Mark. Good morning. Merry Christmas and uh, happy holidays to you and to to everyone, what, what a, a great, great time of the year it is, right? Yeah. It, it certainly is. Same to you, Mike. How's the holiday season been going at Embrace the Race? Well, I didn't get my holiday cold yet, but my yeah. staff and I have our holiday exhaustion from uh, people coming in and, and shipping. And, and uh, you know, let's say uh, the same folks that are sort of the last folks to the window uh, to make their bed are often the last folks to make their Christmas purchases. So, uh <laughs> So, so we're, we've been quite busy throughout the season and especially over the past week. Well, while you've been shipping nationwide and worldwide, for that yep. matter, for, yep. for our local folks, you opened your store this year locally here in Saratoga Springs at 12 Circular Street as we take a look at some video of yep. the store. Mike, how's it gone? It's been wonderful, Mark. You know, you, you, you came to see it, and as have many of your... Uh, your viewers, it, it's right downtown, right uh, right next to the Bachelor Mansion at the intersection of Circular and Broadway. Uh, we've got plenty, plenty of parking for all of the, uh, both Saratoga folks and Capital Region folks. Uh, it's a beautiful place. We put a lot of thought and effort into designing a, a place that's not only welcoming and, and, and uh and showcases our product well, but also is, is a little modern, too. You know, we've got flat screens and iPads and custom branding programs for corporate gifts and, and uh, stables. So, so we've got a meeting area for that. We've got a retail space and, and uh, plenty of product uh, that people can get a real feel for what the brand is about and, and how to help celebrate what they love, which is racing. 12 Circular Street. Uh, there's a Stewart's on the corner of Circular and Broadway. You are right next door. Let's talk some last-minute gift ideas, Mike. What do you have available for the folks? 
Well, we've got we've got a, a whole wonderful uh, glassware collection that we rolled out uh, during the meet and have expanded upon this fall. So it's wine glasses, rocks glasses, ale glasses. We've got belts and keychains uh, for sort of the stocking stuffer. Uh, folks, we've got a beautiful collection of ties that include a sneak peek at our spring collection, which are some wonderful pinks and purples and real beautiful ties. Uh, plenty of stuff for ladies as well, for any of the guys on the uh, who are listening that want to uh, help that significant other celebrate what they love, which is racing. And then uh, we're real excited. We're rolling out uh, and just have this holiday season uh, a beautiful, beautiful collection of of ladies' pendants, both in sterling silver and uh, and gold as well. And that's really exciting because ultimately we get just an amazing response to not only the brand and the idea of the brand, but, but people are captivated by the logo and they want to wear it on everything from hats and polos and now right on up to beautiful, beautiful pendants. Let's talk some important uh, numbers here. Mike, store hours from now through Christmas Eve for any members of our audience who would like to take a drive, the short drive, yep. to Saratoga Springs. What are the hours between now and Christmas Eve? We'll be here all day today. I'm talking to you from here now. We'll be here all day today until 5 tonight. We'll be here uh, same time tomorrow. Um, and, and again on Monday, Christmas Eve, we'll be here until 2. But, of course, as many of your folks know, if you shoot an email uh, to us or call us at, at our local number, which is 580-4500, we're glad to help make any sort of last-minute arrangements and, uh, in between shipping and, and, uh, and in the store. We, we'll do what we can to help. So it's, it's that time of year. We've been thrilled with the response to this idea that we started just just a little over two years ago, which is a scary thought that it's been such a short time, but uh, we really appreciate the response from from everyone in the OTB audience and the racing community. So, whatever we can do to help give a little bit of embrace the race this holiday, we're glad to do it. Now, Mike, I talk every week about EmbraceTheRace.com, your very good website, but, you know, we're running out of time. Yeah. We're pretty close to Christmas. Can folks go to the website, order something, to be shipped out of uh, out of town or out of state and still be able to get it there for Christmas? You know, we can. The short answer is yes. If you place an order today or Monday and we still have it in stock, we can get it out there. You know, we would have to send it overnight. But the, the shipping this year for the holidays is, is delivering uh, on Christmas Eve. We can do that. And the other thing, too, that a lot of folks have been doing is just getting great gift certificates. There's a digital gift certificate option right on the home page so everyone can – go there, you can purchase a gift certificate, the recipient receives an email from us personalized with your information and includes a message as well. So, um, you know, that, that's a great option too, uh, especially as we continue to roll more things out next spring. Um, sort of takes the pressure off of shopping, but, but certainly the thought and the care to give somebody, you know, the brand of racing that they, that they love. Um, I, 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 people have really enjoyed that as well. Well, Mike, I want to thank you personally uh, for the sponsorship. As I mentioned earlier, this is the last week of the sponsorship for 2013. We appreciate it very much. Want to wish you happy holidays, Merry Christmas to you and your staff and your family, and uh, in enjoy the holiday season. We will, Mark. Thank you, thank you to you and, and everyone at OTB and to all of the, the racing fans in the audience. It's been a great great year for us. You'll hear more, much, much, much more from us next year. And, uh, you know, we created the brand for, for the audience, for racing folks. So we appreciate everybody's uh, involvement and participation and support of our brand. So Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays to everyone. Thanks, Mike. We'll talk with you again soon. Thanks, Mark. Take care. Mike Dianzaris, ladies and gentlemen. And we are up to our first break on this December 21st edition of the program. When we return, it's off to Southern California, where we will welcome in Mr. Gary Stevens as we go to the break. The 1977 Swap Stakes from Hollywood Park. Seattle Slew had just swept the Triple Crown, and he traveled to Southern California for the swaps. So we'll take a look at a piece of the 77 swaps to the break. Back with Gary Stevens right after these messages. 
Coming by the stand the first time, it's J.O. Tobin in front. Uh, by two and a half lengths, Seattle Slough is second. By two lengths, Affiliate third by a hit. Tax fourth on the outside. By three lengths, Minnesota Gus is fifth. And Mr. Red Wing and White Sprite around the first turn. It's J.O. Tobin in front. By two and a half lengths, Seattle Slew is second on the rail. By a hit, Tex third. By five lengths, Affiliate fourth. By two lengths, Minnesota Gus is fifth. Then Mr. Red Wing and White Sprite turning into the back stretch. It's J.O. Tobin in front. By one length, Tex just second by a hit. Seattle Slew third. By ten lengths, Affiliate fourth. Then Minnesota Gus, Mr. Red Wing, and White Sprite. And the back stretch is J.O. Tobin in front. By two lanes, Seattle Slew is second on the inside by a neck. Tax third by eight lanes. Then affiliate Mr. Red Wing Miss, and Minnesota Gus. Around the far turn is J.O. Tobin in front. By three lanes, Seattle Slew is second. By half length, Tax third. By eight lanes, then affiliate of Minnesota Gus. Turning for home, it's still J.O. Tobin out in front. And he's widening J.O. Tobin by five lanes. Tax is now second. Three quarters of a length, Seattle Slew third, and affiliate is closing much ground. Into the stretch, it's J.O. Tobin in front by six lengths. Tax to second by a head, affiliate third by three, and Seattle Slew is dropping back. Seattle Slew is well beaten. It's J.O. Tobin out in front by eight lengths. J.O. Tobin, affiliate on the outside in text. And J.O. Tobin is the winner by eight and a half lengths. Affiliate second and nose with text finishing third by six lengths. Then Seattle Slew was four. This is the OTB Television Network, a service of Capital District Off Track Betting. Embrace the tradition. Embrace the passion. Embrace the race. Apparel for the horse racing lifestyle. Welcome back to Down the Stretch, everyone. I'm Mark Cassano, J.O. Tobin in a shocker in the 1977 swaps. Our next guest this morning has enjoyed an outstanding 2013, which certainly is not surprising for a Hall of Fame rider. But when you're coming off a seven-year layoff, that's another story. Ladies and gentlemen, joining us live via telephone from Southern California, Mr. Gary Stevens. Gary Mark Cassano, welcoming you to Down the Stretch. Good morning, Mark. How are you? Good. It's not too cold out there right now. <laughs> Gary, actually, it's a mild morning for us, which we're very, very thankful for. Gary, e even though it's not quite over yet, assess your 2013, if you would. Well, it's, it's been a wonderful year, uh, a lot more than I would have expected at this time last year. I was actually <clears throat> just getting out of my fitness program in Seattle a year ago today, and I uh, had somebody forewarn me that I was going to have a year like this. I, I would not have believed them. It's just been uh, a lot of fun and, and very exciting. Gary, at the very beginning of the year, the very beginning of your comeback, how were trainers treating you? I mean, were they taking a wait-and-see attitude? What, what was your feeling about that? Yeah, it, it was a wait-and-see attitude. I, um, any of the, the trainers that have known me throughout my career knew that when I do something, I'm serious about it. But there's been a, enough ups and downs and, and uh, retirement, you know, and I'm retired and then back to riding and out of retirement again. And, you know, I, I think a lot of people didn't think I was real serious about it because of my work with NBC, HRTV. I, I was in a pretty good spot, you know, and a lot of them were, couldn't understand why I was doing it. And um, I will say that my, my biggest fan coming back was Richard Mandela. And... Um, you know, he supported me, continued to support me, Tom Proctor. A lot of guys jumped on board. Um, but, it, yeah, it was a wait-and-see attitude and, and kind of like, what's this guy doing? Gary, I've picked out three highlights. I know we're a little tight on time, but let's take a look as our audience watches, beginning with the Preakness. Oxbow in front throughout. Talk about how was it to win another Classic? 
Well, it was unbelievable to win another classic. And to do it for Wayne Lucas and uh, uh, Rear Rising Italian that farm, excuse me, was a uh, huge thrill. You know, Wayne kind of put me on the map with my first classic win with winning colors back in 1988 and have it happen again in 2013. With this uh, tough little three-year-old, um, you know, it was probably uh, definitely the best, best feeling in 2013 that I've had up to that point. Gary, they pretty much left you alone on the front end. You must have had a huge smile on your face. Yeah, I did. Uh, you know, but let's, let's give credit where credit's due. This uh, Colt, he was coming into the race great, and, you know, he actually could have stood some pressure early on. Fortunately, we, we didn't get any pressure, and I had a huge smile on my face going into the far turn, and he didn't let me down. He actually accelerated coming off of it, and the smile got bigger and bigger the, the further we went through the stretch. You mentioned Dick Mandel a few moments ago. The next highlight is the Breeders' Cup distaff. As we pick it up down the backside, beholder number five, stalking third on the outside. Gary, in a moment here, you're going to begin to apply some pressure to Royal Delta just inside of you. When she didn't respond, when she had very little resistance, what were your thoughts at that point? Well, I was surprised, but I wasn't surprised at my filly's performance. She'd come into the race uh, the way that she ran, just superb, and uh, she, she'd had some great workouts, great prep leading up to it, and couldn't have been managed any better. And, um, you know, I'll tell you, I, when I went up and, and um, hooked into Royal Delta, that was all that was all my filly to hold her doing it. I didn't ask her to, to do that at that point. She was just in a high gallop, and uh, Mike looked over at me and... and uh, had this look of, like, uh, concession. Um, and I knew at that point he, he was history. And um, then I had to worry about Princess and Fillmar coming running. But I was loaded coming into the stretch. And, you know, the last eighth of a mile was just brilliant. I mean, brilliant for, for uh, Colt, Philly, whatever it has to be. I, I thought that was probably the most impressive performance of the weekend. We had Dick Mandel on the show a couple of times this year. Gary, how much did Beholder improve mentally throughout the year? Well, I wouldn't honor uh, the early part of the year. I, I picked up the mount midway through Del Mar. So, uh, well, at the start of Del Mar, uh, Richard came to me and, and my agent, uh, Craig O'Brien, said that uh, you know I was going to be riding her. They'd like me to work her a few times. and um, You know, she... She can be a little bit testy in the morning. I won't say difficult, but uh, she can be a little bit moody. And we hit it off from the word go. And maybe that's a little bit because I'm a little bit moody. But um, you know, she was she was very very intelligent uh, from the first time I got on. I could tell that you know there was an intelligence level there that I uh, hadn't been around a whole lot. And I've ridden some very talented uh, fillies and colts throughout my career, but she definitely raced right up there with one of the smartest that I've ridden. And when you've got that along with athletic ability, that's, that's the pure thoroughbred. And finally, the Breeders' Cup Classic. For our audience, Mucho Macho Man, number six in here. Gary, what was it like to win your first Breeders' Cup Classic at the age of 50? It was a long time coming, I'll tell you that. Uh, that was definitely on my bucket list. And I'll tell you what, I never thought when I, you know, retired in 2005, I just had accepted. I said it wasn't meant to be, you know, and uh, when I come out of retirement and I found out that I was riding Mucho Macho Man, and I sat down with, with Kathy Ritzbo and uh, Finn Green, the racing manager. We all hit it off, and uh, Finn even said, he said, Gary, I think this is, this is what he's been waiting for, and it's what you've been waiting for, and he was sure enough right there, and, um, you know, thrill of a lifetime, and had to be go down as one of the most exciting finishes in the in the Breeders' Cup with declaration of war, you know, just to head back and then we'll take charge of, uh, you know, two inches back and then for him to come back and run like he did and the foster and uh, uh, Kentucky, the form holds up pretty well. It, it had to be one of the deepest uh, classics that we've seen in probably the last 15 years. I mean, there were, there were six, seven horses in the race that could win it and uh, the best horse won on the day and that was Muso Macho Man from a, a fine training job and management job from the, the whole team. Gary, how much did it help you here in the Classic that you had ridden him in the race before in the Awesome again? Well, it, uh, it really helped me. I mean, uh, it gave me a, a sense of, of uh, confidence, a sense of power. I knew what I was sitting on. and I, I didn't get on him in between. The only two times I've been on Luther's back is, was the Awesome again and the Breeders' Cup Classic. And, uh, 
got a great relationship. He's got a great relationship with the exercise boy. Kathy knows what he needs. And we didn't feel it was important for me to be on in the morning, but I was up there watching him train every morning. And I just saw him keep getting better and better and better with every day. And, and Kathy and Sam kept telling me, you're going to be riding a better horse than, than what you rode in the awesome again. And I told him, I said, just bring me over what I had in the awesome again. We're going to be in good shape. And uh, they brought me over a, a better horse than, than what I rode in the awesome again. And we needed every step of it <laughs> because it was a huge horse race. And, and uh, I'll tell you, it was tough. It was tough the last 100 yards. I'd made a decision that I wasn't going to use my stick on him. I, I hit him one time in the awesome again, and he kind of pinned his ears, and he was like, don't do that again, buddy. Just leave me alone. <laughs> so uh, coming down the final few strides, I finally I, I raised my stick up and just flagged it past his eye one time, and it happened to be right at the finish line and, and maybe made a little bit of difference. But, uh, man, what a thrill. Now, I don't want you to be modest. I want you to be honest because I said that, <clears throat> excuse me, I called that a flawless ride. And when I said that to Kathy Ritvo in our interview, she absolutely agreed with me. How good was the ride? It, it was as good as I've ever ridden. Uh, the name of my book is The, is the Perfect Ride, and, and the reason for that, I'd never ridden the perfect race. Joy searching for perfection, and Joy something you could have done a little bit different. There's not one thing I would have done different in that race, but um, I couldn't have ridden the perfect race without having a horse that was spot on that day. And the way he broke from the starting gate, he actually broke in front, and I was able to get the other speed horses to, uh, to commit and set a realistic uh, pace, and, and I was able to ease back under the finish line the first time and just sit in the garden spot, just stalk, stalking four wide. I gave up some ground, but um, he's a big, long striding horse, and I, I didn't mind giving up the ground. I didn't want to get him stopped. So it was, uh, it was a pretty sweet ride, I guess. Two final questions before we let you go. Last Saturday, you rode Candy Boy to a second in the Hollywood Futurity, but an interesting second as you made a long, sustained run down the backstretch, actually from 10th to take the lead. Talk about his effort in the Futurity. Well, I got, I got shuffled a little bit. You know, I got into a nice rhythm around the first turn, but he started getting shuffled back, and I got behind a horse uh, that I didn't want to be behind. And we turned into the back stretch, and I had a small opening, and it was either step behind a, a wall of horses that were no chancers or, or getting through that hole at that moment. So that's what I did, and I got him out in the clear, and he got into this big galloping stride. And then I got uh, within about, I guess, four lengths of the, the front pack, uh, which in, included the eventual winner. And then uh, my stable mate, uh, Kobe's back, he... He was in front of me with Joel Rosario, and he was set behind him. And, and uh, Joel, he tapped on the brakes about three times, and I said, man, here's my opportunity. I'm going to get stuck behind all these horses. So they, they'd actually, the fractions were realistic, but they slowed it down from the five furlong pole to the half-mile pole. And that's where my horse made the huge move, which uh, gave the appearance of, of which I agree, a, a premature move, but I had to. They were lined up just across the track at four and a half, and I had to clear before I got to the turn to save some ground. And um, I loved what I felt. I wish I'd have probably got on him one time before I rode him, just so I had more respect for what was sitting underneath me. But the way it turned out, <clears throat> no matter how I rode the horse with the premature move, I might not have got beat seven nights, but nobody was going to beat the winner that day. But I can't wait to, to get over here to Santa Anita on the dirt race track. I think that uh, the source is probably going to enjoy dirt more than, than the synthetic, and uh, distance is going to be no problem. He galloped out. He actually galloped past the winner uh, galloping out after the race. He never slowed down. It reminded me a lot of uh, Oxbow's run in the Kentucky Derby. Um, from the quarter pole home, uh, all the way in the gallop out, he never slowed down. So I've got no, no uh, problems with uh, distance limitations with him, and we just hope that uh, everything stays right with him and, and he progresses forward. And finally, Gary, tomorrow, literally closing day for Hollywood Park. Your thoughts and maybe some of your fondest memories of Hollywood Park. Well, um, you know, it's, it's sad. Today's actually uh, my last day over there. I'm not even going to go over there tomorrow. I don't, I don't have any mouth, and I'm not going to go over there. It's a sad day. I don't want to be part of it. I don't like funerals, and uh, to me, this is, this is a, a funeral. It's sad, and I feel like the state let us down a little bit, but, you know, not uh, helping us out with 
some other issues that uh, would have kept Hollywood Park going, but it's done now, and, and it's sad, and a lot of fond memories. I, I think uh, probably one that sticks out the most is my Hollywood Gold Cup on a horse in Cutlass Reality, where mm-hmm. we beat uh, Ferdinand and, and Alice Sheba, two great horses, and uh, just too many to, to talk about, but that one probably sticks out more than any of them. Well, Gary, it's great to have you back. Congratulations on a sensational 2013. Best of health, best wishes for the holiday season, and thank you so much for having joined us this morning on Down the Stretch. Thank you, and happy holidays to everybody out there. I appreciate it. Thank you, Gary. Gary Stevens, ladies and gentlemen, and what a year it was off the seven-year layoff. And we are up to our next break on this December 21st edition of the program. Thank you so much for having joined us. When we return, Linda Rice, as we go to this break, the 1979 Hollywood Gold Cup featured the great affirmed. So we'll take a look at the 79 Gold Cup to the break. Back with Linda Rice right after these messages. The flag is up, and here they come. Affirmed is going to the front on the inside. Now Sir Ladd is taking the lead. Affirmed is second. Tax third on the extreme outside. Farnesio is fourth. Double discount fifth. Syncopate sixth. Then true statement. Saros, how curious, and as the copus. Coming by the stands, uh, it's Sir Ladd on the outside, by a head affirmed, is second on the rail, by a neck, Farnesio third, by a neck, Tax fourth on the outside, by a head, true statement is fifth, Saro sixth, then syncopate on the rail, uh, double discount, how curious, and has to cope us. Around the clubhouse turn, it's affirmed, in front on the inside, by a head, Sir Ladd is second, by one leg. Tax third on the outside by half length. Farnesio fourth by three lengths. Uh, true statement is fifth, zero six. Then syncopate double discount. How curious and as to Copas trails. Down the back stretch, uh, it's affirmed in front on the rail by a head. Sir Ladd is second by a half length. Tax third uh, by a length and a half. Farnesio fourth by three lengths. Zero six fifth. Uh, true statement six. Then syncopate on the rail. Double discount. How curious and Astacopus into the far turn it's affirmed on the inside by a head Sir Ladd is second by a head Tex third on the outside by three lengths Farnesio is fourth syncopate fifth true statement and double discount turning for home it's affirmed on the inside by a head Sir Ladd is second by a head Tex is third on the outside by two lengths Farnesio is fourth and true statement into the stretch it's taxed on the outside by a head. Sir Ladd is second by a head, affirmed third. Now coming on again on the rail. Now it's affirmed in front by a half length. Sir Ladd is second and taxed. Affirmed drawing out. Affirmed and Sir Ladd and taxed. And affirmed is the winner by half length. Sir Ladd second by three and a half with taxed finishing third. This is the OTB Television Network a service of Capital District Off-Track Betting. Using CapitalOTBBet.com is as easy as one, two, three. One, simply log on with your username and password from the homepage. Two, fund your Capital OTB account through our Easy Money, Green Dot, or Visa MasterCard options. And three, place your bet on one of our three easy-to-navigate wagering platforms, Capital Bet TV, Capital Bet Express, or Capital Bet Pro. CapitalOTBBet.com. Log on today. Welcome back to Down the Stretch, everyone. I'm Mark Asano. My thanks to Gary Stevens for having joined us. And you just watched Affirmed. Carrying 132 pounds and inside under pressure the entire trip, Win the Hollywood Gold Cup in a minute 58 and two-fifths. Our next guest is going to try to add to an already very fine year this weekend in New York with the Gravesend today and the Eastview tomorrow. We are pleased to welcome in live via telephone, Linda Rice. Linda, Mark Cassano welcoming you back to Down the Stretch. Thank you, Mark. Always, you have me. always nice to have you, Linda. Um, it's been a very, very good year, which has included 
a milestone for the barn. Tell our audience about that. Uh, well, we uh, <laughs> this week we won our hundredth win for the year, which is uh, um, we were excited about. Uh, we've been in the nineties a lot, and we were hopeful to get to the hundred mark, and and we did that. I think on Thursday with Labrador in the allowance race. Other than Saratoga, which had to be a little bit frustrating to you, since nearly 20% of all the horses you sent out ran second, it has been a very, very good year. Yes, it really has been. 2013 has been very good from start to finish. Uh, I think the only uh, kind of slow period we really had was the Saratoga meet, and frankly the first half of Saratoga, we were stuck in the second beat in the nose, third beat in the head type thing, and but I can't complain because we had a very good Belmont, and um, you know, so it's it's been a nice year for us. Well, your big horse in today's Gravesend is Palace, and he was a fascinating claim to me. You claimed him for twenty thousand, a race after he actually fell. What did you like about him to put up twenty thousand? Well, <clears throat> he's a son of City Zip, which yeah. I'm a big fan of City Zip. Uh, having trained him uh, myself, and uh, he was also a New York bred, so there were added bonuses there, first bonuses, and I thought that, um, you know, I just couldn't see any way that he wouldn't be worth uh, the 20000 And frankly, I looked at the connections, and I didn't think that Windstar or Billy Mott would put him on the racetrack if he was um, not in good enough shape to, to make the course. So um, I added that into my calculations, and, and obviously it's worked out well. It certainly has. Linda, when you claimed him for the twenty grand, what type of horse did you think you were getting? You know, I thought he was a horse that, you know, if things went well, I could probably win the A other than condition. Maybe he'd get up to the two other than condition. <laughs> but uh, I was quite surprised and pleased that uh, about the time I claimed him, um, he just flourished and had a great year. Boy, he has really blossomed for you since the claim. He's won seven times for you. He's become a graded stakes winner. Linda, has one of the keys to his improvement been that he seems to have learned to settle and relax a little bit better earlier in his races? Yes, definitely. I mean, obviously, that's been a learning curve for the horse and for ourselves. My team, uh, Cornelia Velasquez, riding him. And, you know, early uh, in his early races, he was on the lead. And uh, he, through the year, he's developed to be a nice, relaxed, come-from-behind sprinter. And um, that certainly helped his improvement. Well, we are about to take a look at his graded stakes victory in the fall high weight. For our audience, he is number five. He's going to rally in here to defeat a pair of grade one winners in Strapping Groom, who he meets later this afternoon, as well as the Lumber Guy. Linda, talk about this effort, if you would. You know, it was a huge race for us. I mean, he, he had run a great race uh, on Showcase Day, um, which was a, a real tough victory, a real gritty victory over, um, oh, gosh, I'm trying to think the horse's name to finish second, but it was a tough, tough race. And then to step into Open Company, um, Strapping Groom had won the grade one at Saratoga. I mean, it was, it was just some really tough campaigners. And uh, I was so pleased with his effort. It was just a, a, a big effort on his part. I kind of wish that we didn't have to meet Strapping Groom again today, you know. Um, but unfortunately, with the series of sprint stakes in New York, um, I felt like we need to run today. You know, then we come back on February 1st, March 1st. It gets us into a good uh, series of races. So um, I was hoping we didn't have to run quite as hard and beat such a nice horse as Trap and Groom today, but I'm sure he'll put, put forth his best effort. Hopefully that'll be good enough. Your go-to rider, Cornelio, has been aboard him all along. What's he said to you? You know, he's, um, I, he, he's told me that uh, he felt that the horse was better on the dirt than the grass, which it appeared that he was. And um, obviously he's been very pleased. I mean, this horse has got such a finishing kick to him which in his workout, workouts in the morning, he shows that to us in the, in the morning as well. And uh, so he's, you know, he's very confident in the horse and excited about riding him every time. And you mentioned briefly a little bit earlier, he's a son of City Zip. That's got to be special for you. Tell our audience why that's so special. Well, City Zip was 
probably one of the best horses that I've had the uh, luxury of training. He was a great two-year-old, um, unlike Palace, who really developed as a three-year-old. And he was also very unique in that he could press the pace, he could go to the lead, he could take back. Um, he was extremely versatile in his races and showed a lot of desire to win, which is what I see in Palace as well. So that's, that's really uh, been fun for us. You have uh, two others in this afternoon's Gravesend, beginning with uh, Frazzle, who you own, a winner of the 2011 Gravesend. How's he doing? Frazzle's doing well. Um, you know, he's, he had a, a terrific year two years ago. Um, he's put a couple decent races back together. Uh, he's kind of a team player. You know, I wanted to make sure the race filled for yeah. Palace today, so I put him in there, and I'm not positive that I will run him unless they get a few scratches. I think I might take Palace out, or excuse me, Frazzle out and find a better spot. Um, I did put Abra in the race as a, kind of an add-on late because it looked to me there was a lack of speed in the race. And he got in very light at 112. Um, so I put Abra in there to make sure that the pace is on it. So he's quick enough early on to entertain strapping groom? Yes, I think he is. Okay. I think he is. And my clients were excited about, you know, they thought, you know, they'd like to run in a stake. And they thought if we could get a check, that'd be great. So I said, okay, I'll give it a try. Tomorrow, you run a pair in the East View headed by Miss Narcissist, a winner of three straight, following kind of a rocky or somewhat difficult debut at Saratoga. Talk about her. Yeah, she was uh, somewhat embarrassing at Saratoga. You, uh, she didn't look like she was broke very well the first time we started her up there. She was very fractious in the paddock and on the racetrack and behind the gates and um, since the addition of blinkers where it really takes the rider's motion away from her, and uh, she's much more settled. We'd also put earmuffs in her, and we schooled her endlessly, and uh, she's really maturing and developed um, uh, into a nice filly. We're trying her at the two turns. Um, you know, I think that her game of the seven furlong race was a better effort out of her than the six furlong sprint. Um, I think that she'll get the distance, but you never know until you do it, so we thought, you know, it would be great for us to find that out before we uh, lay her up for a couple 60-day break. You know, we're going to give her a little breather, and then at least we'll know where we're going in our three-year-old campaign. So um, we'll see. You're getting so good at these interviews that you're answering my questions before I ask them now. <laughs> Here's her last start. For our audience, this is the November 23rd Stallion Series, and she is number six. In your, <clears throat> excuse me, your other Eastview starter, Champagne Rudy is going to finish third in here. Now, Linda, as you mentioned, she won the seven ace Joseph Jimma two back really very impressively. Here she turned back to three quarters, and she had to work a lot harder for this one. Talk about it. Yeah, it was a hard-fought effort. I was kind of impressed that she didn't give it up because there was no place in the race that she looked like she was going mm. to be the winner at the wire. And uh, I thought it was a gritty effort on her part, but... I think that she favors nicer, easier, softer fractions that she got in the Gimma. And, uh, uh, you know, so I'm hoping that that's going to transfer into a big race in Eastview. Yeah, and even though you added blinkers and she has shown very good early speed, it certainly is not runaway speed. She looks like she relaxes for the rider quite well. Yes, yeah, she does. And if you'll notice in her races, you know, she had trouble switching leads early in her career. And I worked with Junior Alvarado on it, and we talked about it. And she's much happier, and she, she, she finishes better when she switches leads. With softer fractions and a little bit more of a controlled ride, she does switch leads better and finishes better. And I think that all of that is, is much more likely to take place uh, with a so, slower pace in a distance race than a sprint. But as I said, you know, the two turns is a whole different ball game. Seven eighths, obviously, she did well, but we'll see if she, that's a, still one turn. We'll see how the two turns affects her. Let's talk about the upcoming, uh, as, as little as I like to talk about winter, let's talk about the upcoming winter a little bit. How many horses will you have in New York? And I assume you're going to have a string in Florida as well. You know, I have 55 at Belmont uh, that I'll be racing at Aqueduct, you know, most of the winter. I've sent a lot of grass horses home for, for vacation, um, turned them out for 60 or 90 days. And um, I don't have a string at Gulfstream yet. Uh, my intention is to have a small string there, but... We've uh, a lot of the grass horses that I was going to send to Florida have decided to lay up instead and give them a break. So uh, we have not moved into Gulfstream yet. Maybe we'll end up just staying in New York. 
okay? Linda, have you seen or do you expect to see soon any substantial changes now that Martin Panza has taken over for P.J. Campo? Any changes in the look of the races, the way the book has been written? Yes, the new book has has just uh, come out. I think there's going to be some some changes in the conditions, uh, and uh, I think the trainer's colony is going to have to get familiar with them and adjust to those changes. Some of the races that we're accustomed to having won't be available. Um, He's going to change the structure of of the races, the claiming races, whether, you know, probably going to have never win twos, straight never win threes. They won't have the beaten races. They may not have the three-year-old clause on some of the allowance races. So there's going to be a little adjustment period there, but sure, we'll all adapt and figure out how to win races. Well, Linda, as always, we appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having joined us this morning on Down the Stretch. All the best this afternoon in the Gravesend, tomorrow in the East View. Have a uh, wonderful holiday season. Merry Christmas, and we'll look forward to speaking with you again in 2014. Thank you, Mark. Merry Christmas to you Merry as well. Christmas. Thank you, Linda. Bye-bye. Linda Rice, ladies and gentlemen. And it's going to be interesting. Uh, we're going to try to have Martin Panza on uh, shortly, but it's going to be fascinating to see what the changes are going to be going from P.J. Campo to Martin Panza. And you heard Linda talk about some of them in the upcoming condition book. And we are up to our final break. When we return, it's the Jerry Hollendorfer Show. As we go to the break... The 1990 Hollywood Gold Cup, an absolutely fantastic horse race. So we'll take a look at the 90 Gold Cup to the break, back with much more right after these messages. Racing. Stylish winner off the inside was one of the first to go. Ruhlman sprung out of gate number five and he's quickly looking for the lead. Going through near the inside was criminal type, but Stevens has crossed easily on Ruhlman as they go by the judges' box on the first occasion. Criminal type now went up second, followed by Sunday Silence. Third around stylish winner. Sant'Angelo dropping in fifth along the rail, followed well back by opening verse, and it was one of the last with me selecto. Through the clubhouse bend and Ruhlman, as expected, is the pace. Maker. It's Ruhlman setting up the tempo, a length and a half clear of criminal type. In third placing, stylish winner on the inside of Sunday Silence. The pace is not real keen early, and they're starting to bunch up. Opening verse, a length and a half away, fifth. Two to me, Selecto, and one and a half to Sant'Angelo. Into the back stretch, three quarters of a mile to go. Ruhlman is the pacemaker by a length and a half. In second placing is criminal type, who's going well for Santos. Valenzuela's pulled Sunday Silence three deep. He's only a length from the leaders. Follow closely by opening verse stylish winner back on the rail only two lengths covering the first quintet me selecto three away and sant angelo six lengths last it's a great contest at the half mile ruleman just led from criminal type sunday silence sweating on them a length away followed next by opening verse stylish winner feeling the pinch dropped back a couple of lengths with me selecto and sant angelo was four lengths last three eighths out in the gold cup and ruleman just led from sunday silence attacking three wide and criminal type in the center there's three abreast as they come towards the bend. About two lengths away was opening verse as they come to the corner. Ruhlman is under pressure. Criminal type and Sunday Silence have headed him. And they're going to straighten up for the run home together. Criminal type, Sunday Silence locked together. Sunday Silence, criminal type clear from Ruhlman. Then opening verse past the eighth pole. Sunday Silence, criminal type. It's a soul-stirring duel. There's nothing in it. Criminal type, the inside. And Sunday Silence, one head up and one down. This is the OTB Television Network, a service of Capital District Off-Track Betting. Missed one of our TV shows? No worries. Now you can catch all your favorite programs online. Simply log on to CapitalOTB.com and click on the YouTube link at the bottom of the homepage. And look for our new podcast coming soon. CapitalOTB.com. Log on today. I got it.
what it's all about. Welcome back to Down the Stretch, everyone. I'm Mark Asano. My thanks to Linda Rice once again for having joined us. And criminal type who had beaten easygoer and housebuster in the Met Mile went to California, outdueled Sunday Silence. Now, he was in receipt of five pounds, and I think, I'm testing my memory here, which is dangerous at my age, but I think Sunday Silence was making his first start of the year. But what a phenomenal renewal of the Hollywood Gold Cup back in 1990. All right, we've got some news stories for you. David Grenning reported this past week in Daily Racing Form that John Velasquez, who was seriously injured in a spill in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies, is hoping to be back exercising horses around mid-January. Velasquez, who had to have his spleen removed, is presently starting physical therapy. There was an interesting LASIK study done by the Breeders' Cup at its 2013 event. Now, this was an observational study of 55 two-year-olds. Of the 14 two-year-olds who raced on LASIK, now these were non-Breeders' Cup races, of course. Of the 14 two-year-olds who did race on LASIK, 10 of them were observed to have bled to some degree. And folks, that's with LASIK, 10 of the 14. Of the 41 babies who raced without LASIK, only 15 showed signs of bleeding. A far higher percentage of two-year-olds who used LASIK were seen to have bled as compared to those who raced without the diuretic. Now, it was a very small sample, and it was an observational study, but I think those results are very interesting. And Ron the Greek, who upset the Jockey Club Gold Cup in his last start, has been sold to Middle Eastern interests. The winner of $2.7 million, Ron the Greek, may be pointed to races like the King's Cup in Saudi Arabia as well as the Dubai World Cup. All right. Our race of the week past the Hollywood Futurity. The two horses to watch in here, number six, shared belief, the eventual winner, and number four, Candy Boy, the eventual runner-up. Shared belief off a pair of very impressive sprint victories. The last in the Hollywood preview would break very nicely in his two-turn debut and would settle in to a very nice trip. Candy Boy, on the other hand, and you heard Gary Stevens talk about this earlier, in the purple and gold silks at the top of your screen, would make a sustained backstretch long run to advance from the back of the pack to the lead. Now, you don't often see this kind of move by young horses. Tenth after the opening quarter, in front after the opening three quarters. But all the while that Candy Boy was making this pretty impressive run, shared belief was just sitting there, biding his time. I really liked that Corey Nakatani not only didn't panic, he sat very, very chilly. Then, when Nakatani asked Shared Belief for his run right here, the Colt responded in a big way, drawing off to a powerful five and three quarter length victory over Candy Boy. Visually, very impressive off a perfect trip for shared belief, striding out down the lane. But also quite a nice performance from Candy Boy. You know, he came in off a slowly run maiden win. I think he really moved forward. Tamarando rallied for third. So Jerry Hollendorfer runs 1-3 in the final Hollywood Park Futurity. Running time, a minute 42.16. The last two and a half furlongs in 30 
0.78. Those are very, very solid numbers. The final running time and the final two and a half furlongs. Now, Hollendorfer, who, you know, like most trainers, does not to, like to look too far ahead, has mentioned the possibility of shared belief having just two more starts prior to the Kentucky Derby. In all likelihood, they would come in Southern California. Hollendorfer is also a part owner in the gelding. The majority owner in shared belief is sports radio personality Jim Rome. The second choice in a futurity, Tappet Rich, who was an extremely impressive maiden winner three back, has just gone backwards for Bob Baffert. He was rank and nearly uncontrollable while finishing next to last. This victory by shared belief puts him squarely in the running for an Eclipse Award as champion two-year-old male. How about a little more Jerry Hollendorfer? This is the native diver. And turning for home, it's blue skies and rainbows in front. Hear the ghost grinding on the outside of him and rousing sermon outside of both of them. They would finish one, two, three. They are all trained by Jerry Hollendorfer. Now, while blue skies and rainbows held off here the ghost by a half length, it's the latter who I like quite a bit. Here the ghost was coming off just a single sprint effort since March. And Jerry Hollendorfer told us on last week's show that they were using this race as a bridge to get here the ghost to the January 18th Strube Stakes at Santa Anita. Personally, I think that was, you know, while those horses aren't world beaters, remember the Strube is restricted to four-year-olds. And I think that's going to set up here the ghost very, very well for the Strube. Now, we've got time this morning. I want to show you a couple of two-year-old races. We're going to begin last Sunday with a sixth race at Gulfstream Park. Now, this is a two-turn Entry level allowance slash optional claimer for two-year-olds at one mile. And I want you to watch number eight, Coup de Grasse, in the red and white Fox Hill Farm Silks. So we're going to take you back to last Sunday's sixth race at Gulfstream Park. Time. They're off. Coup de Gras broke a bit to the inside, but is going out near the front with Grive on the far outside also flashing some early speed as well. And then it's Prudhoe Bay out with speed in third. Gone as wind is down on the inside as the field races out of the chute. And now it's going to be Prudhoe Bay to take the lead. And right on the outside is Coup de Gras running in second by a length. At the rail, Perchungo, Grive on to the outside. Behind them, Gone as Wind and High Kodiak Warrior. We're all set. Is third last ahead of Mr. Candy and Arangol. 23 and 2 was the first quarter as they speed toward the half mile pole. Coup de Gras on the outside. Prudhoe Bay and Berchungo along the rail. These three across the track with Grive on just to the outside running in fourth. Then it's Gone as Wind. We're all set and High Kodiak Warrior. They went 46 and 1 for a half mile. They've left Mr. Candy and Arango behind. Three furlongs to go. Coup de Gras to the outside. Prudhoe Bay, they're side by side on the lead. Perchungo is down at the rail and sticking right with the front runners. Gone as wind swings out. High Kodiak Warriors caught five wide. We're all sets in behind a wall of horses. And they're coming to the top of the stretch. And it's Coup de Gras, the leader. High Kodiak Warrior to the outside. Runs after him. And then comes Prudhoe Bay. Coup de Gras and High Kodiak Warrior. These two down to the 16th pole. Coup de Gras got the lead. High Kodiak Warrior trying to stick with Coup de Gras. But Coup de Gras wins again. Coup de Gras, a son of Tappet, is now two for two with this one-length victory going a mile at Gulfstream Park. He broke his maiden in his debut at Aqueduct for Chad Brown sprinting. That's, you know, a little bit of an unusual thing. Um, I like the way he was edging away at the end, 
the Holy Bull Stakes now a possibility for coup de grace. Now, finally, this past Wednesday, the Damon Runyon here in New York, state breads at a mile and 70 yards. Please watch number one Samrat as we take a look at Wednesday's Damon Runyon. And they're off. Number four, Deceived, jumped up at the start and trails the field. Samrat is out for the lead. And on the outside is Gomez. Forever Utopia is between those two as they head for the clubhouse turn. It's Samrat with the lead and Gomez giving chase in second. Forever Utopia in third. It's almost three lengths back to Balderdash in fourth. Then after the slow start, Deceived, and at the rail is How About We? The opening quarter mile, 24 and two-fifth seconds. They've straightened away and are now heading up the back stretch. And it is the odds-on favorite, Samrat, who leads by three-quarters of length. Gomez races in second. And now Deceived has made a move on the outside. Deceived is up to third. Forever Utopia at the rail. Two and a half lengths. Back to Balderdash. And how about we? And these two-year-old state breads approach the half-mile pole, chasing Samrat, who ran a half-mile in 49-3. and three. Samrat by three-quarters of a length. Gomez second by a head. Forever Utopia at the rail in third. Then it's deceived. A length and a half to How About We? Balderdash trails midway on the turn. Samrat by a half length. Gomez on the outside in second. Deceived. Forever Utopia heads apart third and fourth. Then comes How About We and farther back, Balderdash, three quarters in one, 15 and one, and they enter the stretch, and it's Samrod, and he's opened up here. It's Samrod in front by seven lengths, and he did it very quickly there. Samrod, in his two-turn debut, is going to romp by 16 and three quarters in the Damon Runyon. Now, he wasn't racing against much, but he is three for three. This son of Noble Causeway relaxed early. Trainer Rick Violet said he behaved very well in the paddock. He relaxed early, even went under some pressure, kicked away late. Now the next start for Samrat, which will likely come against open company, I mean, let's face it, it's time to test the waters to some degree, will either be here in New York in the February 1st Withers or Rick can ship him to Gulfstream for the aforementioned January 25th Holy Bull. But there's a couple of two-year-olds. Um, there was also a, a good-looking two-year-old winner in New Orleans at the fairgrounds named Vickers in Trouble who won a Louisiana-bred sprint race um, by open lengths who looked pretty good. But, you know, we're going to try to keep you abreast of these lightly raced two-year-olds uh, who are just about ready to turn three uh, as the season progresses. All right, time to thank all the folks who helped get this week's show on the air here at the Clubhouse Race Book in Albany, our associate producer, Julie Hoxie, as well as Mick Richards, back in the control room in Schenectady, Pat Peretta directed and did pre-production, Dino Contenacci on audio, Thanks very much to this morning's guests, Linda Rice and Gary Stevens and Mike Dianzaris from our sponsor, Embrace the Race, the apparel for the horse racing lifestyle, who reminds you, now you know what to ask for this holiday season, the brand for you and your lifestyle, Embrace the Race. Tell your family and friends they can shop for you right up through Christmas Eve at the Embrace the Race store at 12 Circular Street in Saratoga. You can call them at 580-4500 or online at embracetherace.com. The apparel for the horse racing lifestyle. Great brand, amazing products, perfect for the holiday season. Embrace the Race. Thank you to Mike Dianzaris and the folks that embrace the race for their sponsorship. Well, ladies and gentlemen, our final show before the Christmas holiday. So uh, all of us here at, uh, at Down the Stretch would like to wish you happy holidays and Merry Christmas. Uh, have a great Christmas on Wednesday. Enjoy all the racing action this weekend from coast to coast here at Capitol, which includes closing day at Hollywood Park. Have a wonderful upcoming week. Merry Christmas once again, and from all of us here at Down the Stretch, we'll see you next week.
You're watching OTB TV, a service of Capital Off-Track Betting.